recollecting here and now the way it is this reference always and then being the knower, the puto, the knower rather than the person trying to know or get or get rid of. So in this sense, though, like the puto is not personal. It's not, it's just a the word in itself that it's for remembering, for reminding. In the Thai forest tradition, as, as I learned it with Lung Po Cha, and the, they use this uh, Bhutto as a kind of mantra. But it's also, you know, it's, it's something used both for Samatha meditation and for vipassana. So samatha is, uh, you know, they usually divide Buddhist meditation into samatha vipassana. Samatha is, you know, are the skillful means of concentrating the mind on an object. So you you're kind of excluding everything but the object that you're focused on. And then vipassana is opening to everything. It's non-exclusive. So then there's a lot of opinions about samatha vipassana and jhanas and and, uh, techniques of meditation in the Theravada and Buddhist world. And uh, of course this, this is, uh, opinions are like this, you know, but it's more important to see an opinion as an opinion rather than, you know, seeing it as something you've got to defend and believe in and, uh, or reject. So contemplate that in yourself, you know, that what I think or what, you know, the scriptures say or this teacher, this Ajahn. And, uh, you know, even if it's a right opinion or view, it is what it is in the present moment. The sense of, of clinging to, to a condition of some sort that you've acquired or your own particular take or viewpoint is like this. <clears throat> so in my own experiments with my mind, observing my own opinions, when I, you know, when I get fixed on my opinion, then I, you can see it in the result when I attach to even though my opinions are always right, it's still an attachment to being right. And then I, you know, I see then the, the result of that attachment, if out of ignorance and blindness, then I see any of you who don't agree with me is wrong. And that's the way the thinking mind is, the dualistic use of language and thought and memory. <clears throat> so in, in Vipassana meditation where, you know, you, you can quote scriptures, you know, about jhanas and things like this, and there's kind of uh, views, strong views about attaining jhanas first and then doing Vipassana and that it's not that it's wrong, but we can be very, you know, blindly attached to a view that we interpret and have scriptural authority for. 
So that's where this awakened consciousness, this puto here and now, isn't about interpreting Pali scriptures or seeing it only in maybe a very literal or particular way of, of uh, thinking, but observing. This, is, this was Lung Pa Cha's whole emphasis. In his, in his conundrum, true but not right, right but not true. Because like I had in, you know, the insight years ago before I ever came to England. And uh, I have a, a tendency as a personality to want to be very liberal and all accepting and, and uh, c coming from positions like all religions are pointing at the same thing and uh, we must respect each other's beliefs and uh, the kind of high-minded, liberal, generous attitudes about religion And then, the, then also the, the the other the other tendency to see that somehow Theravada is um, better than the rest. So uh, there's this one this kind of grag, grand magnanimous tendency, and then there's this uh, this other one that somehow even though they're all you know pointing to ultimate freedom and liberation, somehow Theravada is much better way of doing it. And then just listening to myself, you know, the, the kind of magnanimous side and the opinionated, uh, you know, my own personal preference. And then that which listens. And suddenly, it's, I think I was in Bangkok at the time, suddenly I just saw what I was doing. Because I listened to myself, I could listen to both, both, you know, and the, the magnanimous one is, <clears throat> you know, how you know you would like to present yourself to the world as, as magnanimous, majestic, grand not narrow-minded uh, and then the other, the feeling, you know, personal feeling of Buddhism is better. And these are opinions, isn't it? The one, one's kind of very grand and idealistic, the other is, is personal preference. And that which is aware of that, that is the Bhutto you know, in the terms of this tradition. It's not comparing and saying one thing's better than the other. It's just knowing that if I think Theravada is better than the rest, it's like this. So this knowing is when we say this knowing connected to the way it is. It's it, and then the, this this word uh, panya or discernment. And then you, you know, you it, discerning is in, is not uh, comparing. It's not critical. It's not evaluating anything. It's just knowing pure knowing, dhamma, the way things are the way it is. Now this is like the listening, I've used this sense of listening because uh, 
it's like paying attention. You say, now listen to me. You say, I'm asking you to pay attention. Listening is, uh, you know, you can, when you're in a dark cave in a room without any light and you can't see anything, you still listen. You can listen externally, you know, to the sounds external or you can listen to yourself thinking. Or, be, or a sense of being aware of what you're feeling. So in the in the in the dark, you know, if you've ever meditated in a, in a totally dark room, you know, with no light, and then you know, I'd open my eyes and I'd look at darkness. Then the then the thing, I can't see anything. I can't, you know, there's no light, so I, I don't know what's in this room. It's just, but I'm seeing darkness. It's, I'm saying just by using the sense of vision, opening my eyes and looking at, at darkness, at blackness, it's like this. And then listening to this, the conditioning of the mind to think of you know, I can't see, it's dark, because I'd, the personality is based on seeing things through through light, through having an external light, uh, electric light, or candle flame, something, or daylight coming through the window. But then reflecting on that, that which sees darkness in a dark room, that which is aware, they even of looking, because the eyes are open, you're looking at what's in front of your eyes and it's black, is like this. <clears throat> and then contemplating, and that is consciousness, isn't it? It's consciousness, it's knowing, and consciousness then is, is the light, isn't it? But now it's, it's not external light coming from candle flame or electric light, but it's, or lamp, it's, and this is what we're getting to, getting to this pure uh, conscious, impersonal light that isn't, isn't colored or, or uh, distorted with uh, quality. But which, you know, even though we're, we're conscious beings, we, we, uh, we don't, we've n never investigated what consciousness really is, the experience of our conscious existence within a form. So we operate always from views, that scientific views, religious views, cultural views, and see ourselves accordingly, always through the distortions of, of what we, of memory, of value judgments, comparisons, identities, with the physical body, with cultural attitudes. But pointing out just how, you know, how conditioned we are to see things in this kind of mund mundane, kind of banal way of conditioning. <clears> oh, <throat> uh, you know, many people don't want to reflect on their lives or investigate, they just want to be told, tell me what to do, tell me what's right, you tell me what's wrong. What does the Buddha think is right and the Buddha think is wrong? What is, you know, this is so we, you know, we, we give this authority to maybe something in a scripture or a teacher who we think is an enlightened master or whatever. 
Because on a personal level, you know, personality is is like this, you know, your personality is formed usually around, you know, through the conditioning process. So you see yourself as as unenlightened, limited person. Maybe you you don't have very positive uh, grand view of yourself, so you're you're very much aware of weaknesses and fears and and inadequacies, memories of uh, where you make mistakes or get scolded or get punished and so forth. So we we see ourselves through these these uh, memories. And the personality is conditioned. So, you know, it, your personality can never, never get enlightened. Personality is just habit, ways of, habitual ways of seeing yourself, evaluating yourself uh, as a human person, as a hu- human form. So in the kind of conceit of Western, and sometimes they, you know, I've go, they go to Thailand and they 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 ask who's an enlightened arahant, who's an arahant, and they form opinions about you know what they hear of this monk or that monk, or they 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 go and visit various monks and see things they don't they don't think arahants would be doing, like smoking cigarettes or chewing betel nut, or you know, they're not floating up in the air. And they, they may be laughing or showing their teeth. And according to scriptures, arahants, when they smile, it's a hasid that smile on their teeth, they're never visible. So one, one person I know in Thailand, he thinks, says, uh, you couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't be an arahant because I smile, my teeth are visible. <laughs> and so, that's fine with me, but I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, this is, this is not reflective, isn't it? It's, it might be, you know, views you pick up from reading scriptures. And not that they're wrong, you know, it's not that scripture is wrong, but it is limited, and it is a condition, isn't it? in itself. Then, then of course, uh, you know, in a Buddhist uh, society, you know, you have in the scriptures they talk about devadas and the t- Buddha teaching, uh, you know, the Brahma God and the devas of different uh, levels of refinement and going to uh, to see to heaven to teach his mother Abhidhamma after his enlightenment. And of course, uh, the, the kind of Western mind thinks this, you know, sees this in a particular cultural way. <clears throat> and the more kind of rational and scientific you like to see yourself, then you, you kind of see it as a, or, you know, just kind of accumulated ornaments on Buddhist teaching. The real Buddhist teaching is Four Noble Truths, all that other stuff is just cultural you know, collections around it. And 
we can put it down, we can form opinions about there, there aren't any devadas or anything like that. There's no ghosts, P or anything like this. It's all just superstition. Now, what is that, you know, is, is that it's a conceit, cultural conceit that, that I know that my view is right. There's no ghosts, no pee, no uh, hungry ghosts, or there's no heaven or hell, uh, and devas, there's, not, there's nothing, you know, it's just uh, ornaments in the, you know, coming from maybe pre the religion previous to Buddhism. So we, we can, you know, we quite conceited in, in clinging to these views. And then the, maybe the, the Buddhists, uh, who can, part of Buddhist culture like in Thailand or Sri Lanka, they'll say, well, it's in the scriptures. There's, a, there's Indra and there's Brahma and there's uh, all these other, you know, David Oz coming to listen to the Buddha. What does that mean? And we say, well, it's, it's usually, you know, they talk about, you know, kings are called devas and so on. We want to bring it down to a material, uh, you know, something we can accept on a material level, like a physical king. <clears throat> and notice this conceit that, that's so prominent in, uh, in the Western scientific, rational addiction that we, you know, that's very much ingrained in us in, the, in a, uh, through the cultural preferences of, say, the Western world. So in, uh, in just observing this, this, uh, this, you know, in myself, seeing how conceited I can be as a person, personality. A way the, that my, you know, uh, my personality operates. And listening to it, but not criticizing it, it's just observing what conceit is. Or views, strong views I have about there, no, there aren't any ghosts at all. It's just rubbish. Superstition is, is like this. You know, if I'm clinging to that view, then I'm, then there's an awareness of what I think and, and I believe and so forth is like this. Now, getting that perspective of awareness of clinging to a view. You know, this is an intuitive awareness. You're, you're aware, well, you know what a view is, a viewpoint, or an opinion, and a, an ubadana clinging to it. Now, as you, as you trust in, in the awareness of it, you can see the dukkha of that attachment. You can discern it. You know, I'm right, you're wrong. Yours is just a religious superstition. Mine is a true Buddhist teaching. What is this? You know, is conceit, isn't it? It's out, you know, the sense of my my view is the right one. And is that does that lead toward peace or calm or? Uh, you know, a freedom, or does it put me back into the samsaric world of I'm right, you're wrong? And so this is like discerning the result of clinging to to a doctrine or a ideal or a religious teaching or rational views, modern scientific attitudes. <clears throat> It's not that it's not a judgment against them, but in this uh, intuitive awareness, you're you're coming from a different place than personal conditioning or cultural or religious uh, conditions.
So they, yeah, and so this leaves you with this, this, uh, you begin to recognize that, that really inner peace and stillness come from non-attachment, which is like, to, to the conditioned mind, to the worldly mind, is like a very uncertain. It's my nan time, you know, Lung Pacha's reflection on life, uncertain, insecure. But there's this knowing, this sense of knowing, not having opinions or judging, but pure knowing, consciousness itself, and discernment. And then, you, you know, then you're aware of the limitation that each one of us is under being a, a physical form, you know, so we see, we can only see uh, from this limited perspective <coughs> of this conscious form. But then the, then you also are letting go of identity with form. So it, it isn't that you know everything about everything, but you know, you can discern, all can, you know, <laughs> just by the physical body you have and your, and the emotions, the views, opinions, memories, the sensory experience, you, you've reflected on it and you see uh, all conditions are impermanent. From this perspective, you, we learn from this humbling perspective of a very limited physical form on, in this vast universe. And so the, the Buddha, you know, we're not God, so we don't know everything about everything. And all the whole universe, what, you know, it's, it, you know, the more we try to understand the universe as something out there, you know, we're, we're trying to figure it out through, through uh, you know, modern science. Why not? What's out there? Are there other planets where uh, there are beings like us, other kind of human forms, or are they little green uh, Martians, or are they like maybe, where do the Davidas live? Do they live on Venus or Mars? And all we can is we don't know. There, uh, no, so that's a discernment, not knowing. Because we can only see this far. And we judge things from the cultural conditioning, you know, the personality, the Sila Bhattabharamasa, all this. So we, we can project onto Mars kind of fan fantastic uh, forms of Martian consciousness little green men with, with eyes that stick out of their heads or something. You know, kind of the fantasy world, comic books, <clears throat> science fiction, we can imagine anything. But the reality at this moment is not knowing. And knowing, not knowing. It's humbling because conceit means that I know and uh, I know better than you do. So in my own experience, the more, you know, insight one has in this way, this sense of me knowing a lot begins to fade out. Don't know hardly anything. Just knowing is like this. But there's an awareness that, that is a universal. You know, the, the consciousness is no longer uh, you know, seen in such a limited form as identity with, with my body and me. And so this, this sense of mystery, openness to the mystery, to not trying to, to uh, figure everything out and form strong views about who's right and who's wrong and who's stupid and who's intelligent, but letting go of all that to 
this simplicity, this humility of being the knowing within the limitations we find ourselves with the physical forms we have and the and the personalities that manifest is the knowing they are. We learn about the nature of all conditioned phenomena just through observing the breath. Just by anapanasati you can see, you know, all conditions arising, ceasing, inhaling, exhaling. That's the that's the pattern of conditioned phenomena. You don't need to know every condition, whether it's on the macrocosmic level or microcosmic, but just in the kind of ordinariness of your breathing at this moment, inhaling, exhaling, arising, ceasing, birth and death, beginning and ending. And then this, all conditions are, the base Sankarani, all conditions are impermanent. Is the clue, isn't it? It's not, not a doctrine one grasps. It's, uh, it's uh, w- taking that and, and then investigating. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, feeling, the whole sensory experience through consciousness is about anicca dukkha anatta. Whether it's, you know, universal systems, billions of years, or just the days and nights are relentlessly passing. This is the equinox now, spring equinox, so the days and nights are equal. And at this time, day and night have this, are supposed to have the same length of time. <clears throat> and then from now on, the days get longer, the nights get shorter. You know, so we've been through a winter where the nights are longer and the days shorter, and now the equinox, and then it cha- this is a, just a reflection on just seasonal changes here in England. It's quite obvious, isn't it? Because you, you know, the the it's very quite obvious the way winter, the effect of winter on consciousness, or midsummer, where you have long days and short nights. So you know, in terms of David, uh, the unseen things that we can't visually see or haven't experience. But, you know, there's infinite possibility and potential in the conditioned realm. You know, you think our puny little brain can, you know, it's, this is the ultimate hubris, isn't it, where we think we're God. <clears throat> what I think is what God, you know, is what God thinks. And so then we, you know, this is what leads us to disaster in our lives, where we overestimate ourselves or promote ourselves into a position of being the God that knows everything. Or just seeing ourselves always as a hopeless, limited, flawed person that doesn't know anything and is not worthy of anything. And those are the two extremes. Seeing ourselves always as not good enough and weak and ugly and unlovable and stupid and so forth. Or the other extreme of I'm the almighty God and I know everything is, is, you know, going from one extreme to the other. But the knowing isn't about extremity. It's here and now. Ehi Pasiko, come and see.
one, you know, one thing we can investigate in our own experience within the limited forms we're in. You know, like karma, if, you know, if you, if you attach to um, hatred and uh, desire to annihilate, kill, uh, punish, revenge, you know, if you're attached to these these kind of emotions, well, that, that's what hell is, isn't it? Hell must be like this, you know, full of anger, hatred, revenge, resentments, bitterness, despair. So, in our own consciousness, we experience hell, and because we have periods in our life where we have these, you know, we're angry, full of hatred and resentment, wanting to kill somebody or annihilate, destroy, is like this. Or we can, you know, be, use the power of positive thinking of all is love and and everything's good, and and life is wonderful, and I'm so grateful and happy, and and uh, and where we just think in very positive perceptions, and that inspiring, and and we feel high and happy. Well, that's just you know that's a that's what we can learn from is how you know if we from these rather humbling, kind of banal investigations of, of our own consciousness. We can live in a realm of anxiety and worry. Just by worrying about what's going to happen to the Sangha. Uh, you know, what's going to happen to Amravati uh, when Ajahn Sumedho goes. What, what happened to Theravada Buddhism? Or, you know, unless we do something, you know, maybe we've got to, uh, you know, make a bigger presentation or perpetuate it throughout the world or whatever. You know, we can be caught up in, with good intentions and or just feeling of helplessness. But this Bhutto awareness and is aware of these, these are maybe personal idiosyncrasies or tendencies. And, it, you know, it's not, it's no longer judging but observing, discerning conditioned phenomena like this the self, Sakaya Ditti, Sila Bhattabhara Masa Vichikicha. They're fetters. Fetters then are, you know, things that that limit you, they kind of tie you up, like straitjacket or manacles, chained to the wall, bind you to, to uh, some, obst something that obstructs you. And you can't see, you can't learn because of the obstruction. And then to discern what freedom is, is, you know, it's like, like where there is pure awareness and non-attachment and no self. Because the, even the holding the idea, I'm free person, is still a condition that is another kind of manacle, isn't it? Another fetter. <clears throat> Even considering yourself a free person is a, is a limitation, it's a condition. You see, so this discerning, the wisdom, Banya, the Buddha, is, is the essence of, of the Buddha.
Because I remember, you know, I used to think, oh, I couldn't be David Oz, I can't even see them, you know. And then some, some people would see David Oz, and, and then I think they're just having hallucinations or making it up. And, you know, the way, you know, I consider, because I, I can't see them, that they don't exist. Or my cultural conditioning would tend to uh, disparage that superstition. Yet being brought up as a Christian, you have angels and all this kind of thing. But then it's easy to criticize that because you don't have ever seen an angel. I never have. But then as your, as your intuitive sense develops more, you, you know, there isn't, you aren't so limited in your conceits, your cultural conceits or personal biases. You know, you know you're you know, you're uh, no longer bound or, or tied to such limitation. So then it's more of a sense of wonder, awe, or mystery. And, it, and it's uh, humbling to realize how little one can know and, uh, and that we, we, we learn from, from little things rather than from knowing everything. So the Buddha, in his very, you know, handful of leaves teaching, what he's offering, just a handful of leaves, because he's not interested in what each leaf in the forest looks like, or how many there are. But if you have a handful, then you, you get the general idea, leaves are like this. <clears throat> and they're, you know, whatever, species of tree they are, it's not really the issue, it's getting the general, all conditions are impermanent. It's not, you know, you don't need to know all the conditions to know, to, you know, to extrapolate from just the way you're breathing. And the, the reality of change that we experience through seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, So, awakened consciousness is, is humbling. It's not, it's not, doesn't make us into super, supermen or fantastic figures. So the appearance, you know, of the Buddha parents, I mean, we make, we have these icons which do make them look fantastic. But, you know, the, the Buddhist monk, the bhikkhu, you see, shaven head, robe, kind of ochre, dun-colored robe, barefoot, bareheaded, you know, not a, no crown, no kind of jewels ornamenting the, the body, nothing dazzling or sparkling or glitzy, no velvet, robes, ermine-trimmed collars. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, it's kind of a, it, you know, it is a kind of iconic form in its way of, of non-person. Non-person. So that's why, you know, in, in our tradition, how we pick up this tradition, like, consider what 
what the word bhikkhu implies. You know, how does that affect you? If you're a, if you're a Siladhar and you think bhikkhu, what is that? What kind of emotional reaction do you have to the word bhikkhu? Just to observe, not to, that there's any way you should feel, but observe. It can be seen in highly personal reactions, emotional, being threatened by bhikkhus. Bhikkhu Sangha can even sound pejorative, you know, the bhikkhus, what do the bhikkhus think? We've got to get the approval of the bhikkhus. And the bhikkhus are senior to us. I mean, just to, you know, observe how a word that's meant to convey impersonality just a, a, an expedient means can form some kind of, uh, you, you know, personal reaction, threat. We, can, we should love the bhikkhus, admire them, and at the same time there's all the shoulds, and then there's also maybe a personal reaction. <clears throat> The same applies to bhikkhuni or siladhara or things like this. It's just how these, you know, words, religious conventions, how they, they can, uh, you know, just to see how they, what, what kind of emotion arises when you think of that, these words. Now the aim then is to, you know, the Pali structures, the words, is towards anatta, non-self non-identity and so the the forms are are not you know to be seen in as persons so like the most junior bhikkhu in the tradition is is we're not saying that he's only a junior bhikkhu but he's he's uh, you know represents bhikkhu sangha which is the the, the force that carried the tradition up to this present time. It's not about, about being a junior bhikkhu who just ordained yesterday, and so he doesn't really count. You know, even the most junior bhikkhu is, is, is bhikkhu sangha representing that, and not, not as a personality, impersonality as well as the most senior. So that's the Vinaya structure, the form is not about, you know, I'm not like this, I don't want to bow to that newly ordained bhikkhu, he's just off the streets and, and uh, I knew him when he was a lay person, I thought it was a pain in the neck. No one's going to bow to him, it's humiliating. Because, and that, that's understandable on a personal emotional reaction. But that's what we want to see, you know, to, to use the forms for reflecting on our own personal emotional reactions to structure, to seniority, to the words that we use, to the way we form views and opinions about Buddhism through attaching to our own particular feeling about uh, the, the language, the Pali language, or the tradition we're in. You see, so it's, it's getting to the source of attachment, ignorance and attachment. Ignorance, avicca, dhanha, ubatana. And as long as that sequence is never penetrated, then, you know, no matter how many years and, and uh, diligently you practice, if you never, if you can't get outside those three fetters, then you're stuck there, you know. With your, you know, your own uh, limitation of personality, of the conditioning that you've acquired and, and blindly attached to. <clears throat> so, you know, and then we do, in the community, we do affect each other emotionally, the personal reactions 
uh, you know, liking, disliking, loving, hating, and so forth. That's just, that's just, that's human nature, isn't it? We can't, you know, we don't, because you're, you're a summoner doesn't mean you, you don't have any personality or you, you just be kind of, kind of like a Buddha Rupa or some kind of uh, totally uh, impersonal person. We still have our comic tendencies and, and irritating habits that follow us through life. So, just don't expect your personalities to have great transformations into being saints. But uh, we're no longer binding ourselves to personality. You know, we're liberating ourselves from birth and death, from the conditioning that, that, that we have uh, acquired in this life. Not through destroying it, but no longer believing, operating, uh, being blinded by sakayaditi, cultural conditioning and thinking and the thinking conditioning. So it is a lot to ask, isn't it? Because it, you know, we are very much involved with our feelings and views and opinions and the society we live in encourages that. Isn't it? Modern psychology is always about trying to find your true self and, and you know, solve all your problems and so forth. So it, it's trying to, to be a happy, well-adjusted, normal uh, person, personality, to kind of see if you can get rid of things that are, you know, unacceptable in society or to, that you should be happy, you should be a happy person. And ideals that we have in, in society of how things should be. So the the sum in our life is is not about trying to make ourselves happy or to try to you know convince ourselves that that monastic life is just one experience of happiness, one fantastic happy moment after another, or it should be. But it, it's a, a, a vehicle for reflecting on the karma we, that arises during uh, this lifetime as it changes and manifests in various ways. I remember when when I went to first went to live with Ajahn Chah, you know, in Wat Papong. I was the most junior bhikkhu, just ordained <coughs> at the end of the line, and then of course, but the only farang bhikkhu there. First time they'd ever had a prop farang or a Western monk. So Thai people would come and they'd. They'd bow, they'd go and pay, bow, pay respect to Limpo Chan. Then they'd come over, passing all the other monks, and bow to me. <laughs> and uh, I found this embarrassing, you know. Uh, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't like being bowed to at all. And, uh, and I, did, you know, personally didn't feel worthy of it. So, uh, you know, I just felt very uncomfortable and then I think they should, you know, they should be bound to the other monks. I'm the, the newest and the least trained. And so I asked Ajahn Chah about it and he's just, he, you know, his view was, no matter how junior you are, you're representing Bhikkhu Sangha. You know, so it's not, you know, it can be, in that case it was because I was an unusual one, the only 
non-Thai bhikkhu in the lot, so that did attract attention. And what I want to make of that in some personal way is, you know, my problem, uh, suffering of, I'm so, you know, special that you should bow to me or I'm not worthy. Both are sakaya ditti, isn't it? I'm not good enough. So, like in, you know, when you're a junior monk, sometimes you do find it incredibly difficult when people bow to you because you, you know, on a personal level, you don't, you don't feel, you can feel very unworthy of and, and uh, feel embarrassed by it. But this is, to see that also, to see that that's your sakaya ditti manifesting. Or the way we can think, you know, I'm not going to bow to that. You know, I'm not, he's not worthy of my bow is a form of conceit. <clears throat> so the form, the structure, the form and the seniority structure of it is getting to the root of conceit in whatever way, you know, it manifests as arrogance or as, as uh, feeling unworthy, whether you feel personally worthy or feel unworthy, or get very you know, convinced that I'm senior, you bow to me, or that even though I'm senior, I don't really care if people bow to me or not. One can be, I don't really care, I don't need your bows, I'm perfectly all right. Or, you better bow to me because I'm head monk of this monastery. I mean, both, it's putting it in, in extreme terms of Sakya Ditti. Sakya Ditti covers that whole gamut of, you know, I'm so important or I'm not important at all. Whether, you know, it's arrogant conceit of superiority or a feeling of total unworthiness and impurity. An awareness of that is what? Awareness isn't about judging, but knowing all conditions that any form of personal conceit, whether uh, whatever extreme it takes, is what it is. It's, it's, it's a Nietzsche Dukkanata. And now those three characteristics are the, uh, you know, the suggestion, the way of looking at conceit, not judging it. It's not saying, a need, uh, because all conditions are impermanent, they're bad, because conditions change. They're good, bad, neutral, whatever, according to other conditions. So this is, you know, this is an invitation to really appreciate the teaching of the Buddha, not as some kind of personal, uh, you know, attitude about it, but because it is, it's an invitation to awaken and see and know in a direct way with wisdom. <clears throat> and to really let go of the causes that, that create all our personal suffering and fears and, and anxieties and worries. So in, you know, in, I found, you know, in, sometimes, you know, like you have, there's all kinds of Buddhist monks, you know, so in the Bhikkhu Sangha, you know, in Thailand or wherever, there's very good monks, arahants, very wonderful, pure monks, and then they, then they go to just being rascals, corrupt impure monks. So in, in Thailand, you've got, the, you know, got so many monks, 200,000 bhikkhus, and so they've got, you know, the best to the worst in the range <laughs> from, you know, in such a, so, in so many bhikkhus in one society, you're not, they're not all going to be the best, so they, they range from the very best to the very worst. But in terms of 
of uh, Vinaya, you know, you, you, you're not judging in that way about how high or how good or how bad they are. Because sometimes, you know, you, you know, about to, to monks that I personally don't like or don't respect as a person. But that has nothing to do with it, isn't it? Because of the relationship of Vinaya, then I, I'm, whether their Vinaya is good or bad or is, is no longer my concern. <clears throat> and then it does bring up conceit, like I, I'm I'm more pure than that monk is a, is a kiditi. That's what I want to see, you know, how, you know, I can feel that I am, you know, I'm my Vinaya and my practice is superior to his. Why should I bow to him? Is, is that what I want to be, you know, a, a conceited monk, thinking that, you know, that I'm better than somebody else? Or seeing it as opportunity to pay respect to the Sangha, Bhikkhu Sangha, whether that individual uh, purity or impurity is no longer the issue. It's uh, the, the appropriate response to the, the form, you know, so it's not about judging, comparing, or personal views. I